Good morning, Andrew. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. Thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, really good. Really good. Well, it's a, such a pleasure to get the chance to talk to you on Sentientist Conversations. You've been on my wish list for a long while, uh, partly because I've had some great guests from your veterinary profession already. Crystal Heath, uh, Kevin Saldana, Vicky Bond, um, who I'm sure you know and have all spoken very highly of your work. Um, and I also um, uh, have interviewed Jordi uh, Kasmajana recently. And I was fascinated by his interview of you because it talked about your journey through, you know, your personal journey and then activism and even politics into the veterinary profession. And got to the stage now, as I understand it, where you have more letters after your name than I have actually in my name. So, yeah, it's great to get the chance to understand your, you know, your life story and your ph philosophical journey and the important things you're working on now. But before we get on to these crazy sort of big philosophical questions I like to ask, how would you best introduce yourself and your work? Firstly, I'd like to say it's a great pleasure to talk to you too, Jamie. I'm a, I'm a very bad skier myself, and I know you're a ski instructor in a country that has uh, no proper mountains and uh, very little snow. So I was very impressed uh, to, to read that on your website, and uh, it's a <laughs> pleasure to be talking to anyone mad enough to uh, embark upon a career as a ski instructor in the United Kingdom. Uh, for introducing myself, crikey, uh, I'm originally from Australia. Uh, I tell people that uh, in Australia we uh, send our uh, most serious convicts uh, to England for punishment, uh, and I've been sent here for uh, repeated beach vagrancy. Um, and anyway, but but realistically, I'm I'm uh, a veterinarian. I'm a very experienced uh, dog and cat veterinarian. Um, I've become a, a specialist in animal welfare and a professor of animal welfare ethics and, and leader of the um, Research and Knowledge Exchange Centre in animal welfare at the University of Winchester, one hour south of London which is going to be one of the largest and most active research uh, centres at the university. We have uh, three degrees, including a very successful distance learning master's program uh, that I run, which recruits students uh, globally because it's entirely distance learning, so people can enrol uh, anywhere. And we're involved in all sorts of really exciting uh, research projects. And in fact, we've just published um, a major new textbook. It's the first time that anything like this has appeared in the field. Uh, this covers virtually uh, all animal welfare issues and animal law in all major regions of the world. It's a collaboration of 50 authors uh, around the world. So that's literally just come out and been published uh, free on the internet as, as an open access uh, textbook. Congratulations. And it's wonderful that it's open access, yeah. Thank you. So lots going on. It's all terribly exciting um, and uh, preventing me from developing my uh, fledgling skiing skills uh, any further, unfortunately. So perhaps you can give me some tips on that. From what I understand, they're pretty advanced. So <laughs> I'm advanced at falling over. I'll, yeah. I'll give it that. Well, if you're not falling over a bit, you're probably not trying hard enough. So that's my that's my excuse. Yeah. Fair point. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's a brilliant introduction. So um, let's come on to these big philosophical questions. And I have an obvious bias because in this series of sentientist conversations, I'm trying to popularize and develop um, a really pluralistic, broad worldview that I'm calling sentientism which I summarise as evidence, reason, and compassion for all sentient beings. So the questions we're about to come on to answers the what's real question with a naturalistic approach using evidence and reason. Um, and when it comes to what and who matters, it suggests that we should have compassion, moral consideration for every sentient being, any being that can experience suffering or flourishing. But I'm very lucky in these conversations to talk to people who both agree and disagree. So it will be fascinating to understand how you answer them. So on that first question of what's real, for many of my guests, that's a story about whether they grew up originally in quite a scientific, naturalistic context, or one that was maybe a bit more spiritual or mystical or religious, and how that side of their thinking has changed over their life, if it has. So you can wind the clock back as far as you like to tell the story. All right, I'm going to go off on, a, on an interesting uh, story here. Uh, when I was uh, very young, about uh, 18, um, I... Um, was unsuccessful in um, matters of the heart with a certain young lady. And I, I thought um, I wanted to, it caused me to really question my life and what I was doing and, and to ask where I wanted to go in the future. And I knew from my, from my limited experience at, at that point that in history there had been this tradition of gurus going to mountaintops and meditating and praying to see whether they could receive divine insight. And so... And from Perth, Western Australia, I hitchhiked um, about three and a half thousand kilometres eastwards to the snowy mountains in Australia. And I didn't have any money as, as a sort of an 18-year-old student, so I, I hiked up the um, 
chairlift underneath the chairlift to the top of uh, <laughs> essentially Australia's tallest mountain. And I, I had a last meal and I decided to fast for a couple of days because I, I knew that uh, gurus always fasted on mountaintops uh, in order to receive their divine insights. Yeah. So, so I, I trekked across the mountaintop and, and camped uh, illegally, I have to say, um, and on the summit next to Australia's highest peak for a couple of nights. And I, I got up um, very early before dawn. I, it was the second day and I was starting to get really hungry. So I decided that if I was going to have an insight, it had to, had, had to happen shortly because I was <laughs> getting really quite hungry. Uh, the clock was ticking. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I spent the prior afternoon uh, looking at uh, mountain butterflies uh, and and the sunshine in, in in the plants and and the wonderful views and trying to think about life, the universe, and everything and and ponder ponder um, reality as as I as I understood it. And so I got up before dawn uh, the next morning and and I was on this tiny patch of flat ground the size of a billiard table on basically uh, the summit of one of Australia's highest mountains, looking across a ten kilometer wide bowl of summits. Uh, buried mostly under a sea of clouds with just mountain peaks popping out of the clouds uh, below me. And the clouds in the dawn sunrise uh, went every colour from pink, orange, purple. It was spectacularly beautiful. There was a faint breeze coming in from one side and the temperature was about minus 5 degrees Celsius and it was almost completely silent. And I thought, this is the most stunning Picture. I've never seen anything so beautiful in my life, and there's nobody to share with. It's incredibly uh, alone. I felt incredibly alone up there, and I, I thought, okay, the sun's about to come over the horizon. Please, God, if there's anything out there, <laughs> let me know now. If there's anything I should do with my life, this is so, the moment. Yeah, the sun came up, and I, you know, I'd gone all this trouble. I'd hitchhiked thousands of kilometers. I'd starved myself. I'd climbed mountains, and the sun finally came over the horizon. I got my answer clear as day, unmistakable. It was absolutely nothing. Um, my answer, my answer was that I wasn't going to receive any sort of divine information. Um, I had to go all the way back down the mountain, back into the world, and just carry on and do my best with life the best I could without any any clues or help from above, as it were. So that's been my guiding inspiration since. I think. I think. Um, we all have this amazing opportunity with the lives that we've been given. Um, and the question is, what are we going to do with this opportunity? And I've never found a better answer than simply try to be the best person you can be, try to do the most good you can and the least harm that you can. And I think that we can all try to do that regardless of whatever circumstances uh, or situations uh, we're in, actually. And I've never found a better answer than that. So to me, thank you. Um, and yeah. did you, and, and, it sounds like you've taken a positive lesson from that experience, but at the time, did it feel disappointing and negative? Like, you know, your hopes had been dashed and you were left left alone in a nihilistic world, or were you, did you quite quickly think, "This is great. I'm just going to get on with, you know, doing what I can in the real world." I was very pleased because I could finally eat some food. I have to say, <laughs> uh, so so there was that upside. Um, yeah, but. It would have been nice, I suppose, to have some wonderful arts that come down from above that told me, you know, yes, there is a God and, yes, this is what I should do with my life and everything's going to be fine. But it was also, I think, really unmistakably clear that there was absolutely nothing that was being given to me at least and mm. there was no better solution than just to return to the world and do the best you can on, on your own terms. And Yeah. And that's never failed me. And I think that everyone can always try to do that wherever they are. So I think that's a really good answer to life, really. Yeah, I love it. And you're already leading into the second big question of ethics. But before we get on to leading a good life, um, on this sort of epistemological question and this sort of naturalism, supernaturalism question, did did you grow up in a sort of more religious family? or or and And I guess has that experience left you without a sort of religious or a supernatural worldview completely like mine because i'm just a sort of bog standard was christian now atheist now trying to apply naturalism in every route so have you gone down that path or is do you still have a sense that maybe there is something transcendent and supernatural it's just maybe you know inscrutable and not the sort of thing that engages in personal experiences or I mean, it yeah. was that trajectory been for you well, well firstly i grew up in australia and uh, our entire country is 
you know, we, we, we pretend that we're de descended from convicts. Um, certainly we are relatively secular as a nation. Yeah. We don't have a strong uh, um, religious tradition, uh, although, of course, we have all sorts of religions and, and very welcoming to all faiths and so on. Um, so my household was was representative of that. Uh, since then, I went through veterinary education. It's very much about uh, science and evidence uh, and healthy scepticism, I suppose, uh, of positions and theories. So, um, and as I say, I've, I've done my own personal um, attempt to to reach out to the divine, and I, I got nothing back. So, yeah. I haven't seen myself any evidence that, that there is anything out there beyond what beyond our own our own uh, lives and the physical world as as we increasingly try to understand it. And, yeah. No, that's great. Thank you. So we've answered what's real, or at least we've got an idea about how we might work out what it is. Um, the second question, which you've hinted at already, is quite hard to detach from it. Some people like to have this sort of is or distinction and never the twain shall me. But I think quite often our understanding of, you know, who we are and what we are and our place in the world, of course, leads into thinking about ethics too. And you talked about this sense as you came down from the mountain of um, just doing what you can to lead a good life. And that really is the essence of our what matters question. So as we think about what matters, what, what, the, what, do, what does lead, leaving, le leading a good life mean to you? What a good and bad and right and wrong actually mean? Is it possible to explain what the essence of those things are for you? Uh, I think uh, it's all about trying to do the most good that you can during your time on earth and doing the least harm that you can. But uh, it's important, I think, not to take this or take yourself so seriously uh, that you become a grim and uh, an uninspiring person, as it were, uh, somebody that is alienated from other people because they spend all their time being very serious and, and trying to, to do, do good. It's also important to continue to uh, be human, uh, to enjoy your life and to not burn out. Uh, there is a great problem within certainly the animal advocacy movement, but also uh, professions such as uh, the caring professions, uh, yeah. that is the medical professions, veterinary profession, of people burning out because people do work too hard and forget to also live a bit and enjoy their lives. So I think I think we need to, if we have the opportunity to, to pick pathways that enable us to do the most good that we can, that's fantastic but also um, don't, don't forget to look after ourselves and, and to avoid burning out because you do more good in the long run if you dial back a bit, I think, and keep things at a sustainable level so that you can carry on doing it very long term indeed. Uh, yeah. And that's really important. Makes sense. Um, and um, we, the way I put it is we've got to have compassion for ourselves and the people around us as well as the world, the planet, whatever else we care about. Um, you know, we we warrant our own compassion too, and that's quite easy to forget sometimes when you engage in big big issues and big causes and important ethical topics. So. And and we do forget that, and we're not trained to um, to consider ourselves if if we're very much if we come from these sorts of tra traditions of being concerned about others and trying to help others, and and that also feeds into the caring professions, the medical professions, and so on. So there's been recognition of this recently and of the importance of, of doing this. And my argument for those of us who weren't trained that way is to realise that if you're going to do the most good for others, you have to um, ensure your own health and well-being so that you don't have time times when you're off work. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So there's an in indirect way of achieving the same thing. Yeah, exactly. And then maybe a more enlightened way of thinking through it. Yeah. And uh, I think most people around the world would in, agree with that sort of intuitive ethical core that morality is about others and how we care about others you know as you said you know doing good for others and trying not to harm others it seems pretty intuitive and pretty straightforward although a lot of moral philosophy seems to distract from that simple core and go off onto all sorts of interesting tangents but i think that core can i can i can i say i think that's why it's such a good baseline principle because yeah everybody everywhere wherever they are can aspire to doing this and can aspire to being the best person that they can be so it's a simple clear message and something we can all aspire to I've, I've never yet found a better answer to the question of what should we do with our lives if somebody ever comes up on one sure i'm happy to change but been on this pathway now for several decades and 
never found something better. Yeah, it seems simple and solid, and you don't need a PhD to understand it either. Um, but I think many people would agree, as you say, it's a sort of ethical, moral baseline, at least an aspiration. Of course, we fail to achieve it, but at least we could sort of, that's a common ground, I think, with most people. Um, when we can put, you know, people struggling with psychopathy to one side, but most people, I think, would get get that. But um, the second critical question we ask here is who matters? Because I think most people would come on the journey with this to thinking about trying to avoid harm and being good to others for friends and family and, you know, humans like us. But as you push further, um, people fall off the wagon. So I'm interested in your journey um, in, in thinking about who matters, again, how you were brought up and how you extended that sort of scope of moral consideration and where you've got to now, if you set a boundary at all. Yeah. So once I came off the mountaintop, I came back to Perth, Western Australia, and I thought, okay, how do I just go about, you know, trying to, to do good? I thought, oh, right, I'll get involved in the Red Cross Soup Patrol going around the streets of uh, the city of, of Perth, our capital city in West Australia, at night time providing uh, soup and bread for homeless people, and that was fantastic. I thought I'd get involved in uh, Amnesty International and uh, work on people um, suffering from human uh, human rights violations around the world. Uh, also involved briefly in the uh, Australian uh, campaign to ban landmines interna internationally and also to try and increase our foreign aid budget. But at some point I realised that um, the numbers of animals actually being impacted by practices such as intensive farming practices uh, globally were many times greater than numbers of people being uh, tortured and suffering human rights abuses that I was reading about in the Amnesty International reports. However, the capacity of the animals to suffer was not many times less than the people that were suffering from those sorts of environments and procedures. So I thought, look, there are millions more animals being impacted their capacity to suffer is not millions of times less it is a more important issue so i continue to support all sorts of human causes but i directed my primary focus onto animal issues thereafter so i became involved in australia's campaign to ban uh, live sheep exports we had the biggest live sheep export trade in the world uh, leaving from my home city exporting around five million sheep a year to, mostly to middle eastern countries on the longest, uh, one of the world's longest sea voyages, actually, about two to three weeks duration. Yeah, it's awful. During which 100 to 150,000 sheep would die at sea each year because of bad conditions on the ships. So that's kind of what, what drew me in. And um, then I've, I've had a 25-year uh, career as a professional animal advocate uh, thereafter. Yeah. So you quite naturally extended your work in the world to take non-human animals seriously. Um, and how difficult was your journey of applying that in your personal life? Because I think that's another distinction. Some people will say, I agree with you about this harm and doing good thing for humans, but non-humans just don't matter, or they don't matter anywhere near enough to warrant them being a serious issue. Others, I think, would come with you on that journey about you know animal activism and charities and um, harsh conditions and uh, pet cruelty and even some selective wild animal causes. Um, but would conveniently carve out, for example, animal agriculture and food and clothing and, and the use of products. What was your journey like on that front of thinking through the implications for your own pers personal choices? Because often that's the toughest thing. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose this began for me when I was about eight years old. Uh, my parents gave me a book on baby animals, and I looked at all these uh, baby deer in forests and other animals and I thought these animals look uh, wonderful I'm, I'm not going to eat these animals anymore so I marched up to my parents and declared I was going vegetarian at eight uh, years old at, at the age of eight and, and they they smiled and thought to themselves no worries this will only last a week uh, but it didn't last a week it lasted a lifetime I became vegan when I was uh, 23 so um, that's I suppose where it began but as I became an adult I hopefully developed some more um, intelligent thinking at some point and uh, it's, I think, reasonably obvious that a really important uh, criterion for moral consideration is whether um, a person or, or an animal can, can suffer, um, and indeed more broadly, whether they're sentient, so whether they can uh, experience um, sensations um, 
positive and negative uh, experiences, certainly pain, suffering, stress, distress, but also positive experiences as well, such as joy, happiness, uh, satisfaction of, of all kinds. So if a creature, a person or otherwise, can experience those things, then I think it imposes uh, an obligation upon us to try to act in ways that uh, minimise negative experiences for others and, and maximise the positive ones if we wish to consider ourselves as ethical agents. If we wish to say, I don't care about the impacts of my actions on others, if it causes suffering, that I'm fine with that, then it doesn't matter. But most of us aren't like that. Most of us do want to be uh, ethical uh, people and to to minimise harm and suffering caused by our actions. The obvious um, moral baseline is uh, to consider uh, creatures that can experience suffering and can experience positive states uh, as well. So that would exclude things like inanimate objects, clearly. There might be other reasons to value those to some degree, but uh, not, not in this way. Uh, it would exclude potentially... Um, single cell living organisms and very simple life forms uh, which haven't developed the capacity to consciously experience anything. Uh, but it certainly does include uh, any creatures that have the capacity to have those uh, experiences, positive and negative experiences, to suffer pain, stress, and also experience pleasure and joy and positive things as well. Yeah, thank you. And for me, it flows very directly from the way you were describing ethics and morality earlier on, if it, if morality is our choice to care about others and how things are for them, then surely we should care about any other that can have a quality of experience, right? That can care about themselves. And it just yeah. seems almost tautological to me. It's, it's a no brainer, isn't it really? And yeah. all, all we have to do is just think about this just a little, and then we very quickly get to this point. And, the criterion that uh, we should care about creatures if they're sentient is near universally accepted amongst animal ethicists, philosophers, people that have, have thought about this issue to any degree. Yeah. It seems to be the criterion that makes the most sense and is very widely accepted. Yeah, and it's an ancient idea as well. This isn't something we've just dreamed up recently. You know, you, you don't just go back to Bentham's Can They Suffer or um, even, you know, Al Mari in the year around a year a thousand right the blind philosopher arab Ar arabic poet who was one also you know he was atheistic and challenging religion but he was also explicitly talking about the sentience of non-human animals and the implications for our exploitation of them but you go back even beyond that to you know ideas of ahimsa right do no harm yeah. it's not just do no harm to our species it's do no harm so we've got yeah. no excuse really these ideas have been around for a, a long long while but that's right. Um, the debate is really about which kind of creatures might be sentient. It's not about if a creature is sentient, should we act in ways that avoid causing it pain and suffering and maximise its well-being. There isn't really a debate about that ethically. Yeah. There, is, there are questions about which creatures uh, have sentience and, and what kind of morally relevant capacities uh, as well. Yeah. And, and that's partly the way I've tried to frame this sentientism worldview, is that it doesn't say you know, here's the list of the species or beings or entities or even substrates that might or not be sentient. It just says that whatever sentience is and wherever it is, it matters. But then the naturalistic part says, and let's use evidence and reasoning to work it out rather than some sort of arbitrary, convenient declaration that you might go back to Descartes. Absolutely. You know, the, and, the, and the probably apocryphal stories about him torturing his wife's dog, right? So you need that combination of actually engaging with reality to understand where sentence is likely to be. And that will always be an imperfect exercise, along with the compassion for all sentience, wherever it is and whatever its nature. Um, but but it's it's quite interesting because the the first time I found the word sentientism used, and it's not a term that has really escaped much from the academic literature, I'm trying to break it out and recast it in a modern sense, was actually to criticize the idea. So it was around, it was in the 70s and the 80s, and people like Peter Singer and Richard Ryder and others were building on the work of others before them to talk about sentience as being a criteria for moral scope. But the first time I saw the word used was actually to criticise their thinking and to say, look, this sentientism is just another form of discrimination. This sentiocentrism is discriminating against entities that aren't sentient. So, you know, what about a biocentric view that cares about 
living things that aren't sentient, like single-celled organisms or plants? Or what about an ecocentrism or a holistic view that cares about the planet as Gaia and the rocks and the rivers and trees as well? What, what's your thought about going beyond sentience in terms of moral scope? Into Yeah, there are um, intuitive arguments for uh, morally considering non-sentient entities such as uh, forms of art, um, geologic formations, perhaps um, things that we consider to be uh, beautiful, have aesthetic value, or particularly rare, although you could argue against the latter because uh, examples of egregious cruelty are also very rare and not necessarily something that should be valued. Nevertheless, there are arguments beyond simply uh, consideration for sentience or valuing non-sentient uh, beings. And in an ideal world, it would be nice to be able to value uh, all of those entities for which there were good arguments, as well as all sentient beings. And you might get to the point where you didn't want to uh, to dig up any patch of earth, for example, because you are violating the integrity of the inanimate object of the earth and so on. You might not actually be able to live in the, the real world in a practical sense. Um, in the real world, we don't have unlimited resources. We do unfortunately have to make choices about what we choose to prioritise and what we choose to, to value more highly. And I think it's it's reasonable to, to do our best, and we'll never be perfect, but to do our best to uh, protect um, those the interests of, of those who are sentient, so, so living creatures who have the capacity for sentience, uh, more, and, and to value those more highly than inanimate objects, including uh, forms of art, um, rare geologic formations, uh, things in the universe that might simply be rare. Um, if you think about it, living creatures are the rarest uh, phenomena across the known universe, actually. Um, the, the, I think the second law of, law of thermodynamics um, dictates that molecules ought to uh, spread out to assume an even distribution in any given space. Well, life forms violate that. Uh, they are molecules coming together. At least form. temporarily, yeah. <laughs> Intricate and complex arrangements, the likes of which um, seem to exist nowhere else. So uh, they're incredibly rare. Um, we ought, I think, to to value them, and in particular those that are, are sentient and, and can and suffer and so on if we wish to consider ourselves as ethical agents. So I think that intuitively makes sense. Yeah, thank you. And I and I think I I share. I tend to be quite strict about a sort of sentientist scope, um, but I share a rich and deep concern for our shared environment because of its impact on all the sentient beings. And and it, it, it tends to be a bit like a sort of strange attractive vortex for me because almost every source of value ultimately seems to still come back to sentience for me. So even with the idea of the aesthetic value of something, I think the value is because of what it, the positive experience it. As for us as sentient beings, I think if there's a beautiful artwork that nobody ever experiences, you know, maybe it's less relevant. But I, th I still think we can share that appreciation, maybe for indirect reasons rather than more direct. But I'm also, I try and, you know, check myself that I'm not falling into another form of dogma. So I'm, I try to be quite open minded about, look, could we go beyond sentience? And I'm quite relaxed about that. I'm much more concerned with the exclusion of any sentient being than I am about going beyond sentience um and unfortunately they do seem to go together so you know the central gravity of the modern environmental movement for example feels like it's done this it's purporting to have this really rich generous ecocentric concern but conveniently excludes practical concern for vast swathes of sentient beings in the world and in our farms at the same time so that's you know i'm more worried about that exclusion than i am about going beyond and i liked what you said as well that even if you do have a concern for non-sentient life or ecosystems or things of aesthetic value there still has to be some distinctive priority for beings that can suffer you know that suffering surely still has to matter so even if you do go beyond sentience you can't ignore the salience of sentience so because we do have uh limited resources and we do have to prioritize and make choices and that's reality unfortunately yeah, yeah exactly thank you um, so we've now answered what's real, what matters, and who matters. So that's most of philosophy put to bed. That's pretty good in 37 minutes. I think we do quite well. So let's come on to the final big question of how can we make a better future? So another really, <laughs> really easy one. And there's a sort of thread of breathtaking naivety running through my work here, because my hope with this sentientism worldview is that 
if we can fix our epistemology, never perfectly, but if we can commit to using evidence and reason to engage with reality intelligently, and we can agree that at least we should have a sentiocentric compassion that every sentient being matters, that basically underpins our ability to solve all of the world's problems. So, <laughs> But at the same time, because it seems to me that almost every world problem is underpinned by a failure of compassion or a failure of epistemology, people just believing stuff that's wrong, making mistakes, or people just not caring in a sort of simplistic sense. But at the same time, that is breathtakingly naive, because even if you could address those things, we all know that the dark heart of many of the world's challenges, human and non-human, often feel like they're more to do with powerful social norms and political inertia and so on. So, you know, there are challenges here, even if we can fix our epistemology and our um, moral scope too. But in that sense, how do you think first big picture about how we can make the world a better place? Because you've pulled on many of those levers yourself. So do you have a sort of overarching view before we dig into some of the causes you're focusing on now? Yes. um, The modern effective altruism movement uh, recognises that there is a vast array of issues that we could choose to to work on and encourages us to, to not be seduced by the first issues that happen to come across our path but actually to think strategically about our choices. And we can look at all the issues we could work upon and we can think about which uh, are the most important, which are likely to have uh, the most impact, do the most good, but also secondarily, um, which are the most um, tractable, which are the most um, offer the most opportunity to, to actually make change because there are many issues that we could sink a lot of our time and resources into, but uh, they're not very tractable to, to being changed. So that's the second thing. Um, and then um, solvability, the, the issues for which solutions do exist um, or are close to existing. And then the fourth criteria might be our personal skill set and opportunities. Uh, how well aligned are those with uh, various issues that we could choose to work on? So if we think about all the choices open to us and we consider which are the most important issues, which, which ones could have the biggest impact, uh, which ones have solutions uh, most available, which ones are most solvable or tractable, open to being changed, and also our own abilities and opportunities, then you can logically work through through the options and, and come up with hopefully a pathway that will enable you, know, you to do the most good that you can. Um, myself, I'm a uh, experienced, very experienced uh, small animal veterinarian, uh, so I have treated uh, cats and dogs for nearly a decade. Um, uh, I'm very interested in uh, vegan pet food uh, because this is something that I have the opportunity to to make a real difference in. Uh, there are potentially really huge benefits uh, associated with this particular issue. It's something that's very solvable because uh, we now have a plethora of nutritionally sound products coming to market in this area. It's something that is tractable. We know what the top concerns of consumers are and there's a very significant minority that that are willing to consider change in this area if those concerns can be met. And it's something that my personal skill set and opportunities have given me the the, um, ability to really contribute to. So I think everyone can potentially go through that kind of process wherever they are um, to make similar choices that ought to put them in a position where they can do the most good with the opportunity that they have available. And ultimately, that's their lifetime. We've, We've all been given this incredible opportunity. We're here on the planet. We're alive question is, what are we going to do with that amazing opportunity that we've been given? Yeah. And it would be fascinating to, to dig into the vegan pet food space. Um, because in a way, I think it's a classic case study of some of the broader challenges we're facing. Um, because you have challenges of industries, consumers, um, animal agriculture dynamics, the role of the veterinary profession. Um, and, you know, I have to start by saying, you know, there's there's a given we're talking about epistemology and the uh, criticality of getting our facts right, there's a real danger of motivated reasoning here as well from you know people like you and me who really would l- love to see ultimately in- enter the exploitation of animals and the end of animal agriculture too. Um, so I'd love to get your sense of, um, one, how do we guard against that motivated reasoning, even if they're positive motives? <laughs> Um, but also the big picture of that space. And, and some of the starter questions for me include, you know, how much of animal agriculture is bound up with the pet food industry in terms of scale? 
but then it would be really interesting to get into the um, classical pushbacks that we'll hit here around health, choice, suitability, um, and those types of things. So would you mind giving a sort of a, sort of a, a primer on, on the issue? Because I agree, it's neglected and has massive opportunity. Sure. So it used to be the case that uh, pet food, meat-based pet food, uh, was mostly um, created using byproducts of the human uh, food production industry. So byproducts of animals being slaughtered for human consumption. So in its essence, it was viewed as positive recycling. Uh, but that has actually changed uh, very much because of two things. One is that there's been increasing premiumization of pet food. Uh, people are increasingly viewing cats and dogs as members of their own families and wanting better standards of care and diets for them, uh, including uh, a lot less use of byproducts and more prime cuts of meat uh, from animals being slaughtered more directly for pet food rather than for human consumption. Secondarily, there and, is... And uh, just to it's a fascinating dynamic because in that sentence, at the one hand, you have humans granting direct and rich moral consideration to non-humans such that they are part of the family and at the same time a blatant disregard ad, for the Increasing <laughs> adverse impacts for farmed animals at the same time. You're absolutely yeah. right. It's a wonderful uh, example of how we... Uh, often selectively consider others. Uh, we selectively consider our, our pets in this case, but uh, overlook uh, farmed animals. And there is no good um, ethical reason for doing that, uh, quite the contrary. So the second big concern in this area is the increasing growth of pet ownership globally. We have around 3 billion out of the human population of 7 billion, 3 billion developing world consumers who have um, increasing disposable incomes. And as that is occurring, they are adopting uh, increasingly what they see as desirable uh, affluent lifestyles of westernized nations and that includes pet ownership which they haven't previously had the opportunity financially to to do it on a large scale so we're seeing countries um, particularly uh, China um, increasingly adopt uh, well, uh, pet ownership um, so the numbers of um, owned cats and dogs are increasing globally their diets are changing uh, the adverse impacts on farmed animals and on the environment are increasing as a result of that. My forthcoming study looks at the uh, in environmental impacts of pet food and the uh, expected benefits that could accrue globally if the world's cats and dogs are transitioned onto nutritionally sound vegan diets. And they're really substantial in terms of greenhouse gases, uh, food animals' lives spared, uh, additional food energy savings uh, to, to feed probably more than 100 million additional human beings uh, globally each year vast savings in land use, water use, fossil fuels, pesticides, fertilizers, and so on. So the benefits are really huge. Um, we know that there is the real potential for change because surveys of thousands of uh, pet guardians uh, in North America and the United Kingdom, Europe, have indicated that around about 35 to 46% of people would be interested in switching uh, away from traditional conventional meat-based sites if their top concerns were met, and those are concerns about pet health, Mm -hmm. uh, diet nutritional soundness, um, how much the pet would like the new food, and also environmental sustainability. Interestingly, price was not mentioned as one of the top five concerns. Mm. So what I've been doing, what other researchers around the world have been doing the last couple of years has been uh, doing large-scale studies looking at these um, outcomes to try to find out really what are the impacts on pet health, uh, also how much the animals like their new diets, um, what, what about the um, nutritional soundness and quality of, of these diets compared to traditional ones and environmental sustainability is, is the one I'm working on currently. Yeah. So, so the, and, and, and the pushbacks, you know, some of the more nuanced pushbacks are around, you know, palatability and choice and, um, you know, genuine concerns about health. But the top line pushback actually seems to mirror the sort of classic meat troll on Twitter that you might find who basically says, you know, I'm a carnivore. I need meat, you know, and they might actually have a bit of an argument when it comes to cats because there's there's a little bit more of a story there anyway. But the top line is the top line is very direct, right? It's you know carnivore, therefore meat consumption. But yeah, again, it's a matter of just turning on the brain cell and actually thinking for a second. And if we do that, everyone is very quickly reminded that cats, dogs, and all species have requirements for a certain set of nutrients not four ingredients they're not the same thing yeah so another echo with the human 
debate yeah. around diet. So, yeah. so um, conventional meat-based pet food is supplemented with all sorts of nutrients because the natural nutrients are often degraded or destroyed by um, high temperatures and pressures during processing. So vegan pet foods also need to be supplemented to ensure the full range of nutrients that are present and the same supplements are used, perhaps slightly more of them. Um, so so yeah, you do need to ensure the diets are nutritionally sound. They do need to be supplemented as meat-based uh, pet foods are. But providing you provide all the nutrients and none of the dietary hazards that seem to be more common in, in meat-based pet food, you would expect health outcomes as good or better. And that's exactly what the large-scale studies of thousands of animals are showing. Actually, it's it's incredibly exciting. Yeah, and the, and the again, I want to, you know, I, I, this is the danger in my own mind, right? Because I look at the abstract of the study and I'm like, I want to believe it, and you dive in. So we have, you know, we have to check ourselves. Um, but it does seem increasingly that the default scientific consensus is that plant based diets for dogs, but also increasingly cats. Uh, are at least as healthy and often more healthy. It does seem to be the weight of evidence that I've seen so far. One challenge is how much of the evidence is from um, the humans reporting perceived well-being, and how much of it is actually a, more directly validating that these non-human animals are actually doing okay or doing well. Yep. A systematic review was published within the last week, and this is where researchers troll through the scientific databases and find every relevant study they can and look at the whole lot together. So this was a systematic review about uh, vegan pet food, and it found quite a lot of studies. So they fell into two groups. There was uh, those studies that looked at um, animal outcomes, uh, being uh, blood tests, uh, veterinary phys physical examinations, uh, data from the animals themselves. And those were great because those are the most objective forms of data that you can look at. But it's quite expensive to do that. So the numbers of animals in these studies tend to be fairly small in the tens of animals, very often numbers such as 30 or 40 or 50 animals. Um, and then the second group of studies is where you survey uh, guardians of animals, uh, giving us information such as uh, how often um, do they need to use medication? Uh, have the animals had to progress on to a medical diet? Do they have to see the vet an unusually high number of times? What's their own opinion about the health of their animal? What's the vet, vet's assessment of the animal's health as well? So you're getting there a range of opinions, but also a range of more objective data, which is being reported by the guardians of these animals. Mm. So this is not quite as reliable as the first group of studies, but it does allow you to cost-effectively uh, include thousands of animals. And when you have such large numbers, you get a high degree of statistical reliability, meaning you can reliably extrapolate results to the whole population of dogs or cats. In an ideal world, you would do the first group of studies involving thousands of animals, not just 30, 40, or 50 animals. That would require hundreds of thousands of pounds. Nobody has come to me yet or anyone else in this field and said, I'd like to give yeah. you hundreds of thousands of pounds to do this research. If they would like to, then I'm sure that I and colleagues would be very open to receiving all that money and to doing that research. In the meantime, as you say, the weight of evidence uh, seems to be um, very consistent. In fact, it's becoming quite compelling now. There are something like uh, nine studies in dogs and about three in cats and more are coming uh, this year looking at just health outcomes. Um, we're seeing benefit uh, across a range of studies and there's certain specific types of health disorders seem to be less common in animals or on vegan pet foods. And there are clear reasons why um, uh, that seems to make sense when you consider uh, dietary hazards which are being eliminated in the uh, vegan pet foods. There are no studies in which um, adverse health outcomes have been reported in animals maintained on, on vegan diets consistently across more than one study, but there have been benefits consistently reported across more than one study. Yeah, thank you. And I'm uh, in the human dietary realm, I'm not a specialist at all but i'm quite comfortable with the story that uh, a well-planned plant-based diet can be at least as healthy as an average diet because of that story about the nutrients and because to be honest the average diet is a pretty low bar to be anyway i i am a, uh, you know there there's lots of evidence out there about the actual benefits of a plant-based diet for humans and then i tend to be a little bit more hesitant about that i haven't gone into it i'm not sure you necessarily need the 
argument, but it, you know, there's a story developing there. But it almost seems as that you have a higher degree of confidence when it comes to non-human animal plant-based diets than maybe we should have about the benefits of uh, to humans. Is is that fair, or am I? I think that is fair, and you could say that. Well, perhaps the bar is even lower um, when yeah. you're considering a normal diet uh, when it's a pet food than a normal diet when it's a human being. So it's even easier to produce better health outcomes if you introduce a superior diet. Yeah. Perhaps that's why. But as I say, the studies are showing some pretty uh, exciting benefits. The most recent study in dogs uh, showed that on average, uh, dogs on vegan diets were living one and a half years longer. That's like a human being living a, around about an extra decade at the end of our lives. Yeah. Imagine how we would feel if we had another 10 years of life. On top of that, uh, the quality of life seems to be improved as well because they have less problems with, in particular, things like obesity, mobility disorders, and itchy skin, uh, which tend to plague dogs. So they're enjoying their lives more and they're living for longer. So we're not having equivalent outcomes in, in that example. We're having superior ones. And as I say, I think there are reasons uh, why um, this makes sense when you consider dietary hazards which are being eliminated uh, in nutritionally sound vegan pet food. And is it fair to say, so it's not sort of magical benefits of plants, right? It's removal of hazards that are in the y yes, animal so based food. And, you know, people talk about uh, antioxidants and phytochemicals and beneficial uh, vitamins in plant based diets for people. Um, I haven't really looked at that uh, yet with respect to pet food, but it is clear that um, vegan pet foods do not include uh, animal sourced allergens, which cause yeah. so many problems uh, for the skin of cats and dogs and ears and gastrointestinal systems and also that the hazard of overnutrition excessive calories uh, perhaps is less common we are seeing less problems with obesity mobility disorders um, in cats and dogs on vegan diets as well and that improves their quality of life and their longevity as well yeah thank you and um what's the latest distinction between i guess the two big questions of dogs and cats so our family dogs have been vegan for years and seems completely healthy and happy um but there's a sense that cats are a tougher challenge is that gap closing or how are things changing for mm. cats from your research yeah biologically there are no there's no difference between cats dogs or any other species with respect to their basic needs they need uh the nutrients that the species requires it needs to be supplied in a formulation that's uh, palatable so the animals are happy to eat it and it also needs to be uh, adequately digestible so that these uh, products can get into the bloodstream and reach the cells in the body. And if you formulate a diet that meets these criteria, you should expect health outcomes to be at least as good or better. And that is what we're seeing. So uh, it's just a matter, I think, of getting those things right. It's it's not really rocket science. You've just got to take appropriate care to ensure in the manufacturing that you supply all the nutrients, uh, that they're adequately digestible and so on. We've studied the manufacturing um, of meat-based versus uh, plant-based uh, pet foods. We published that study uh, a couple of years ago, and it showed that um, on average there wasn't really much of a difference in quality uh, measures between companies producing meat-based and plant-based uh, pet foods. Uh, the ones producing the plant-based pet foods were doing slightly better overall. It may be because this is a more controversial area and they were going the extra mile to ensure that their products were nutritionally sound. I don't know what the reasons were, but the evidence indicated that the quality uh, of the products and the nutritional soundness was slightly better across the plant-based ones compared to the meat-based pet foods. Yeah, thank you. And um, so I've got a good sense of your degree of confidence at the moment. And of course, we always want more research and more evidence and things might shift and change. And if um, there's a rich benefactor amongst my listeners and viewers who wants to help you fund the research, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pass them on to you. Um, do you have this sense that there are, are remaining niggles or risks or areas of potential worry that could emerge? Or does it feel more like we just need a, a broader, richer base of evidence, but we're on a solid track here? I, I don't have those concerns. Um, mm. We now have well, really quite a lot of studies in dogs. Uh, we've got about nine at the moment, uh, and there are at least two more uh, coming that I'm aware of uh, this coming year, which have confirmatory and uh, even more exciting results, actually. Uh, in cats, we have got uh, at least three. Um, I'm working on one right now with uh, various researcher colleagues, including mm. statisticians, which 
we've just gotten feedback from a scientific journal that are very positive about that and that'll be a very exciting study when that is published as well um, so the evidence is um, pretty good uh, no scientific study is ever perfect um, but you make a weight of evidence evaluation, you look at all of the uh, pooled collective evidence and indeed the systematic review published uh, earlier has done exactly that and they've concluded that nutritionally sound vegan cat food and dog food um, doesn't seem to be associated with any problems and uh, there is some evidence of benefit associated with these diets. So that's really good news for the sector. Mm. So I think the focus doesn't need to be so much on the research. I think it needs to be on, on getting this information out there because nearly all of it's just been published in the last year or two and more of it is still coming most of the uh, pet owning world is not aware of it actually yeah. and not aware of the benefits and i think what a difference it would make to to everybody if, if they could have their, their dogs living one and a half years longer and, and uh, living more happily and spending less money on, on medications and veterinary visits and so on not to mention the the benefits for the the wider environment uh the farmed animals uh, and so on so this information really does need to get out there so yeah that's why i'm grateful to you actually for giving me this platform and to anyone else that, that would like to help me get the message out there as well and this is why i think it's a fascinating case study right because if humans were completely rational compassionate beings and our institutions reflected that your this developing field of research would right now be creating a radical sea change in consumer demand which would be driving a radical change in the way retailers operate and stock their shelves and what they demand from producers. It would be driving radical change in producers um, who would be switching product lines and also driving new levels of innovation into plant-based foods. The veterinary industry would be completely on board talking about the health of companion animals and the impact on uh, farmed animals. The environmental lobby would be talking about the land use and the water use and the pollution and the zoonosis and the emissions and the and the environmental benefits and the whole thing would just switch in a really rapid just transition that would probably take i don't know a couple of years at the outside now <laughs> what's your sense of all of those different stakeholders of you know the pushback you're getting how fast things can change how can we make that complex it's, it's machinery actually, shift it's actually really exciting um I used to have uh, pet food companies coming to me for research summaries, uh, considering producing new vegan pet food brands about once every three months. That was a couple of years ago. Nowadays, it's every two weeks. Wow. Uh, there is a plethora of new brands coming to market. The uh, National Pet Food Manufacturers Association in the United Kingdom has just revised its fact sheet, recognising that uh, nutritionally sound vegan pet food uh, can be good for pets. Uh, the British Veterinary Association has committed to updating their position uh, soon, hopefully. I see huge interest in this area. It's an incredibly exciting space to be in. Uh, a new disruptive uh, pet food industry is emerging. Um, the way that uh, many plant-based products have been disruptive in the human food space uh, as well. So I think it's a hugely exciting uh, space to be in. I feel very privileged to be in, at the centre of it, actually. And I think we're going to see a lot of uh, activity in this area in the next, next couple of years. Yeah. So you seem quite optimistic, despite the those the challenges we face in the human, uh, you know, animal mm. agriculture space. Do you think it will actually move faster than what we're seeing in the human dietary realm of plant based foods and animal agriculture? Potentially, um, the sector has been valued as being worth. Uh, $9 billion globally in 2020. That's the vegan pet food sector going up to $16 billion by 2028, which is a compound annual growth rate of 7.7% .7 each year. So it's actually a very fast rate of growth. This has got to be one of the fastest growing sectors in the food industry. And you know, if any, if you have any wealthy investor listeners out there who, who don't care about uh, the issues but just want to make money, then this would potentially be a really good <laughs> yeah. thing to yeah. invest in because it's just growing so quickly, actually. We know that the drivers of this change are people's concerns for uh, the health of their companion animals, uh, the happiness of them, the environmental sustainability of their dietary choices, even farmed animal welfare. And those concerns aren't going to decrease. Concerns about climate change and the environment aren't going to go away. This is not some kind of a fad. People's concerns for the health and well-being of their pets isn't going to decrease over time. That's only been increasing. Um, so this isn't a fad. The long-term drivers are strong. They're only going to increase in the future. I think this could grow even more quickly. Yeah. The key is getting the information out there to the uh, pet-owning world. And once we do that, then 
uh, growth rates are going to pick up. Yeah, it sounds very exciting. And it how is. do you think it will, do you think it's completely orthogonal to the human diet plant-based space or could it actually act as an accelerant, do you think? Do you think there's a possibility that people might find it easier to make the switch with their companion animals and that might, you know, again, breathtaking naivety, mm. that might lead them into thinking you know, in a richer way about their own consumption, their own diets? Well, we know that um, people who are already vegan themselves are much more likely to be feeding vegan diets to their companion animals, actually. Mm. Um, it works we, that way around, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. Um, and Do you think it might a, work the other way around as well? Yes, yes, it could. Um, yeah. We often, people who adopt vegan diets don't usually do so in the beginning because of the obvious arguments uh, concerning animal ethics. They do so because of uh, personal benefit. They want to feel healthier, uh, to feel better in themselves. And once they make the change and start experiencing some of the benefits, they will often uh, realise that this isn't such an alien and terrible thing to be doing. And they'll then become mentally open to other arguments uh, for veganism. So there's a process that, or a journey that people tend to go through. If people were to adopt uh, these diets for their dogs and cats and to see uh, the resolution of health problems, itchy, itchy skins, uh, body weight problems, which are so commonly seen in these animals, it might open their minds up similarly to consider the benefits of these diets uh, potentially for themselves as well. So there is that possibility. Mm, yeah, thank you. Let's, let's see. Let's see. It sounds a very exciting space. Uh, famously, one of the uh, producers of these diets in the US uh, ate uh, his product, his dog food product on uh, live on television uh, to demonstrate that um, this is human consumable and it doesn't have the hazards which are so commonly off-putting in meat-based uh, pet food. So, look, you know, it could go even further, couldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it also plays nicely to the palatability question that you touched on before. So I, yeah. I, I sometimes run workshops in schools around philosophy and worldviews, and we came onto this topic in last week actually with some sort of 15 year olds and one of the questions was isn't it unfair to you know force uh, a dog to have a plant-based diet you know shouldn't they be able to consent and, and so on so that led into quite an interesting conversation about yeah okay you're assuming that eating a meat-based diet first is an ethically neutral default and it isn't right so why would we start there and two the genuinely seem to love the food right and if the producer will eat it on tv too then that helps with the palatability argument it certainly does um <clears throat> people need to i think uh not kid themselves that the meat-based pet foods that they might be feeding their dogs and cats in any way resembles a natural feeding regime for dogs or cats uh yeah. they're being fed body parts from animals they would never naturally have consumed uh, ancestral dogs and cats uh don't eat uh chickens uh fish uh duck um cows and the various other animals um, whose body parts they're being fed mixed with all sorts of unnatural additives packaged up into dry kibble or out of cans and fed at predictable times daily uh, a cat for example would naturally hunt and kill a variety of small mammals birds and insects um, consuming food at unpredictable times followed by uncertain periods of hunger so the the um, normal feeding regime of a domesticated dog or cat is is very far removed from anything that could really be considered natural. So why is there so much concern about switching from one unnatural feeding regime to another if potentially it has benefits in terms of health and also environmental sustainability and, and farmed animal welfare as well? Um, but So these are sorts of questions and arguments that humans can have, but I think more important than asking people and discussing amongst ourselves is asking the animals themselves, and how do we do that? We do that by a uh, detailed study of their behaviour at feeding time. So in one of our studies, which we published last year, we um, surveyed more than 2,300 uh, dog guardians and 1,100 cat guardians, and we looked at every known indicator of palatability of how much they like their food uh, at feeding times. And we looked at how these uh, varied between animals fed vegan food and meat-based food. And then we analysed it all statistically to look for significant changes. And we found that when you did that for really large numbers of animals, there are no statistically significant differences. There's no apparent difference in how much these animals enjoy either meat-based or vegan food uh, across the board. So we can argue amongst ourselves, but actually if you look at what cats and dogs think, uh, as indicated by their behaviour, they seem to enjoy the vegan pet food just as much as the meat-based. And indeed, that's what you were saying with your own dog, uh, apparently enjoying 
the vegan pet food that you feed as well, which is yeah. great. Luna's a fan, yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Thank you. It sounds very exciting. Um, and one of the things that I find encouraging is that the veterinary profession itself seems to be taking these ideas on board and quite open to shifting. And I guess that's partly driven by the fact that the veterinary profession is a caring profession and that care for the companion animals and their health is central to this agenda. But there are other spaces where the veterinary profession has some much tougher challenges and often some quite aggressive pushback. And that's in the field of, I guess, animal agriculture itself, where the veterinary profession is embedded and enables the continuation of that industry, even though, of course, it is the very antithesis of a caring you know, business model, if you like. And I had a fascinating conversation with Crystal Heath, for example, and the pushback and the challenge she's had. What do you think about those dynamics, about core animal agriculture and the role of the veterinary industry and, and the political challenge and the pushback in that space? Because it feels like you're not having so much of a struggle in the pet food space. Yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate that I'm not. Um, the vets that are opposed to the use of uh, vegan pet food usually are vets that simply don't know about all of the evidence that's been published about positive health outcomes, uh, which, to be fair, has only been published in the last couple of years and some of it's still forthcoming. Um, so it's really important, as I say, that we do get this information out. Once you um, show vets the scientific evidence and you remind uh, them that uh, animals need nutrients, not ingredients, um, then most vets do come on board. And the ones that don't are the ones that unfortunately are more resistant to sound reasoning and evidence. And most vets aren't like that because we are trained to be and hopefully we're selected to be people that uh, care about scientific evidence and that use good reasoning. Um, so so I've I've done well because of I, I, the evidence is on the side of this issue and so is the reasoning. Um, in With respect to the farmed animal problem, um, the veterinary profession is very broad. It covers... You know, everything from turtles and wild animals through domesticated dogs and cats all the way through to farmed animals. And when we're looking at um, farmed animals, uh, we are looking at species um, for whom the paying client, i.e. the farmer or producer or the company, um, wants um, processes to occur that are harmful to animals and that are not uh, good for the welfare of animals for reasons of profit maximisation. And that might be confining animals into very small spaces with a minimum of environmental enrichment it might be inflicting uh, painful husbandry procedures on them such as tower docking castration ear cropping and so on without using painkillers because it's cheaper not to provide those i'd also argue that being killed is quite a negative thing for your welfare too absolutely and so that these is that the essence of the industry yeah so these all maximize profit and you've got a client if you're a farmed animal there you've got a client standing in front of you who wants your support basically as an animal engineer to help tweak the system to maximise the profit that can uh, be produced from that system. Yeah. Um, and that's not always the same as upholding good animal welfare. Sometimes it's contrary to good animal welfare. And then we have a huge conflict of interest. We've got, on the one hand, the vet that's supposed to be upholding animal welfare as their primary concern and duty, and that's written into things like uh, veterinary professional codes of conduct and veterinary oaths. And on the other hand, a client that's paying them and pressuring them to do something else. So we've got this massive conflict of interest, and I can't think of any other profession where there is uh, such a huge conflict of interest between the best interests of the, the paying client and the best interests of the being that the, the professional is supposed to be looking after. It's pretty stark. Um, yeah. It's a huge elephant in the room that nobody seems to talk about. This is enormous conflict of interest. And unfortunately, what has happened uh, in the farmed animal sector and with farmed animal vets is something called um, uh, industry capture. There's been a capture of um, the veterinary profession by uh, the interests of uh, the industry. And we have veterinarians engaging in and condoning procedures, which are clearly contrary to good animal welfare because of money. And that uh, is fundamentally wrong and it fundamentally undermines the ethos of the veterinary profession and I think ultimately the trust uh, in the veterinary profession by wider society who does rightly expect veterinarians to uphold animal welfare as their primary duty. And that's clearly not going on in some of these practices in uh, intensive farming. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and, uh, you know, there are so many situations, the ventilation shutdown methods, debates, particularly in the US at the moment, just just the latest of a long list of examples. But yeah, thank you for that diagnosis. And um, hopefully it's something we'll fix. But 
yeah, th these changes are hard, even when the answers, you know, even when the ethics and the epistemology are obvious. But when there is big money involved, it can be hard to achieve uh, change. That's right, and we're seeing yeah, that here. Absolutely, and I don't think it's too strong to draw back to examples of other industries we've seen resisting change in the past. You think of big tobacco, you obviously think of big oil. Um, and I think animal agriculture are using the same playbook, often the same lawyers, the same lobbyists, the same PR agents, the same story. I think many of those professional advisors pitch to the animal agriculture industry about, you know, look, we managed to push, um, you know, the climate crisis recognition back by a couple of decades. Imagine what we can do for you. Um, it's deeply cynical, but yeah, follow, follow the dollars, I guess. I'm afraid so, and the solution has always been to shed light upon uh, the truth, uh, to get the truth out there. We do have the, the truth on our side. We've got right on our side. It's a matter of doing the research, providing scientific evidence, you know, using sound reasoning and communicating and getting information to policymakers and to consumers and, and to even to the industry. Um, there are people in all sectors that, that do care about trying to make things better and trying to do the right thing. And uh, it's often not fully black or white. Um, so it's a matter of, you know, casting light upon these issues and trying to get the information to all of those stakeholders. Yeah, thank you. That's wonderful to have you leading the way. So um, there's one more, more question I wanted to ask you about making a better future before I let you get on with your busy day. Um, and this is delving a little bit back into your activist past, because um, as we're thinking about this sentientism worldview and various online communities, um, We've been thinking through some thought experiments about what would it do if you applied that worldview to many of the things we've, you know, many fields of human knowledge. So we've worked on, you know, what would the sustainable development goals look like if you rewrote them from a sentientist perspective, or what would the Universal Declaration of Human Rights look like as a Universal Declaration of Sentient Rights, and so on. Um, and you can take that through into economics and uh, agriculture and law and all sorts of different fields. But one field I'm really interested in is that of politics, because part of your activism has, has been actively engaging in politics. And those of my listeners and viewers who are in the UK will be intrigued to know that you ran against our uh, once one time Prime Minister Theresa May in, in an election. So I'd be it'd be fascinating to know, you know, how did that play out for you? But also, how do you think we can bring non-human sort of sentientist voices and roles more directly into politics without it just being seen as a sort of crazy niche issue. What's your what's your sense of how politics writ large can have an influence here? This um, came from the Dutch political party for the animals, the Partij voor de Dieren, who are the most successful political party for the animals globally. They have uh, very large numbers of people elected at local level and a significant number elected at um, national level as well. And following their inspiring example, uh, political parties for animals have been set up in uh, many other nations now, uh, right across Europe, uh, as far away as Australia, uh, here in the United Kingdom, where we have the Animal Welfare Party as well. And I was asked to be a, a political candidate for them in a number of elections that we've contested, including against uh, Theresa May. Uh, as, as you noted, I was uh, competing against her in her own constituency, which was um, very interesting. Uh, there's lots of entertaining stories I could tell you about that, uh, which we don't have time for. But the key thing I think about doing this is it's a, a way to remind um, politicians and indeed voters that uh, we shouldn't just be concerned about uh, human well-being, human issues within society. Animals are very much part of our societies as well but their interests are often overlooked and they're often left out of policy making. So it's a way to, to insert their interest back into the political conversation and to remind uh, the larger parties who, who do uh, hold power uh, that um, th these animals exist, their interests exist, and that actually you can formulate uh, good policies uh, to advance their interests, which often help people as well, and that there are votes uh, to be won by doing so. So we never realistically expect to uh, get very far as a, as a marginal political party in the United Kingdom, although I have to say that out of all of the, the um, non-major parties uh, standing against Theresa May, we beat a lot of them. We were the leading non-major party. Nevertheless, we're not expecting to be a major party. What we do want to do is take the opportunity of, of elections to, um, to represent the interests of animals and to remind people that uh, animals and their welfare are important and they're part of our societies and they ought to be respected. 
So that's been successful. We have had some of the major parties uh, seeming to uh, adopt more animal friendly policies. Uh, when I stood against uh, Theresa May, uh, we uh, shed a lot of light upon the Conservative Party's support of fox hunting and the desire to bring back hunting and to repeal the Hunting uh, Act, which uh, outlawed uh, hunting of dogs. So because we shed so much light upon that, uh, that was quietly dropped thereafter from the Conservative Party uh, plans, and we've not seen any attempt to bring the Hunting Act um, or to, to repeal the Hunting Act, which is fantastic. So there have been some benefits uh, as a result of what we've done. Yeah, thank you. And I think you're right. In, you know, in countries with a proportional representation system, you can actually go get political power and you know have some formal representation. But in places like the UK with a crazily backward first past the post, yeah, you can still have an influence by pushing and nudging the, the major political parties. And it is one of those issues that does seem to be able to span across different aspects of traditional political worldviews. You know, you might be more liberal or more conservative in your mindset, but you can still come to the non-human animal issue with a with an open heart and mind often. As a personal development um, experience, it was amazing for me. I had had this impression that, um, and you, you may laugh at this, but you know, someone who's uh, in government or a politician ought to be an expert on all sorts of issues and and know the issues very well and be very intelligent. And then I turned up to my very first ever hustings events. Uh, I didn't even know what a hustings was uh, before I started doing this, and I found myself in town halls with audiences of in the hundreds in front of me uh, with representatives from other parties on on panels uh, to my side and uh, sometimes even um, from very interesting parties such as the um, Lord Buckethead uh, or the uh, raving monster loony party and, and so on but, but but also the representatives of the major political parties and I discovered to my shock and I admit so somewhat to my horror that uh, it was remarkable how little um, many of them seem to know about some of the issues and how well you can actually do if you simply read the news. You simply, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I read The Guardian, I, I pay attention to the news, I'm, I'm aware of current affairs, and you can simply talk in a reasonably legible, eloquent way. Uh, I actually did really well and I really enjoyed myself. <laughs> you know, I got the whole audience thinking about animal welfare issues and it was a fantastic experience. So I'd encourage any of your listeners to who, who might have thought politics is, is not for them, to perhaps think again. It is remarkable how well you can actually do if you were just a reasonable, normal person who uh, pays attention to the news to some degree and can think to some degree and communicate to some degree. It's not that hard, actually, and you might do remarkably well. You might even enjoy it. Yeah, I love it. That's a great message. And you can do that at so many different levels as well, depending on you know, how your country is organised. You don't have to be trying to become prime minister, but maybe one day we'll have... Dr. Andrew Knight as our first vegan vet animal welfare party prime minister putting your cabinet together. I look forward to, look forward to that day. We'll see. I think I think the workload might terrify me. Um, but yes, um, I'm not <laughs> I wouldn't say no to the opportunity. But there's so much good you can do. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Thank you. Well, so we've now answered what's real, what and who matters, and how can we make a better future? It's been absolutely fascinating to talk to you. A, a real privilege. Is there anything else you'd like to add into the conversation? Um, but also, how can people you know, follow you, learn more about your work, support you, give you ten thousand or hundred thousand pound research grants? Um, that would be most welcome, of course. Um, look, whenever we publish any of our exciting new research, and I'm typically publishing around about six or seven pieces a year at the moment, they go onto my LinkedIn um, page and also my Facebook page. Uh, I have a website which is sustainablepetfood.info where. Um, increasingly putting evidence published by all researchers as as that becomes available in this area as well. So watch this space. Uh, the vegan pet food sector is at the start of a hugely exciting growth curve. Um, and it's just a very exciting field to be in. Uh, watch out for further developments. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. I'll include all of those links in the show notes. Well, it's been an inspiring conversation and a hopeful one too. Thank you so much for all of your work. And it's been a pleasure to have you as a guest on Sentientist Conversations. Please stay in touch, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed and have a great day. Thank you.